weeks have been like very hard things and even the last couple of messages I've had to give has been very hard messages to give because always if you give them you have to experience them. Um, a couple of weeks ago there's a you know a revival going on I might have said something about it um, with some faith healers that were coming in town and I was asking God I said God is this of you you know I was praying to God saying is this of you is this something of you um, and I, you know I didn't necessarily get the answer but you know wasn't necessarily like that. had to know the answer. I was just asking, you know. And, um, you know, when it was my turn to, turn to teach, it was teaching on Balaam, who was, a, you know, essentially a false prophet, pro false teacher. So it was like, oh, Nathan, you asked me for the answer. Did you expect to not have to study about her? Expect not to have to know the an that answer. So today, that's what we're going to talk about is false teachers, false prophets. Um, so Joshua 13, 22, it says, The children of Israel also killed the sword Balaam, the son of Boer, Boer the soothsayer, among those who were killed by them. So at first, I just want to go through some passages on Balaam, talking about you know what Balaam did inside this story, and then we'll go to the New Testament, where it talks a lot about Balaam and about why he was a false teacher. Um, but the first thing here, and Joshua is saying that he is a soothsayer. It doesn't call him a prophet. It calls him a soothsayer, or almost like a, a conjurer of spirits. Um, so then we know from Joshua that's what he is. So then we'll, we'll look and see as the story goes along, we'll go with it with that understanding that he is a soothsayer. So Numbers 22.6, it says, Therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So this is Balak calling Balaam saying, Hey, I've heard whoever you curse is cursed, and whoever you bless is blessed. And we might think of that as whoever you say is healed is healed, and whoever you say is cursed is cursed is not healed. Or we might, all kind of things that we might think of now, whoever you say is going to have profit is going to have profit, which there's many people that we see nowadays that are able to do that. So Numbers 22, 18, it says, Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the words of Yahweh, my God, to do less or more. <clears throat> so one thing I just want to point out with this verse is, Balaam says he can't do anything unless Yahweh, he doesn't even say the Lord, like it's not even like a little Lord. He actually says Yahweh there. He says, I can't do anything unless Yahweh allows me. So it's a soothsayer who says he can't do anything unless God allows him. So that should make us say, okay, man, I, I know all kinds of people say that. I can't do anything unless God allows me to say it. I can't say anything to you all unless God allows me to say it. And we'll say, oh, that's a man of God, right? Numbers 22, 20. It says, and God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, arise and go with them, but only the words which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam heard from God. He heard from God. So God spoke to Balaam. It wasn't like God actually spoke to him. And God told him, like, only say what I tell you to say. So, okay, know that there's people that hear from God that come and speak on God's behalf who are soothsayers, right? Numbers 23, 11 and 12 says, Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Essentially, Balaam is saying, Yeah, yeah I've cursed who I've cursed, and I've blessed who I've blessed, but the only power I have is what the Lord has put inside my mouth. That's the only power I've had is that the Lord has given it to me. Right? Numbers 23, 17 through 24 says, So he came to him, and there he was, standing by his burnt offerings, and the prince of Moab were with him. And Balak said to him, What has the Lord spoken? Then he took up his oracle and said, Wait, what did he do? Have you ever heard a prophet do that? So then he took up his oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. 
God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I can't reverse it. Balaam had no power except what was given to him by God. God had told him to bless him, so he said, I have to bless you. I cannot reverse it. I cannot say something differently. Keep going. It says, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. Yahweh, his God, is with him, and a shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Look, a people rise like a lioness, like a lioness, and lifts itself like a lion. It shall not lie down till it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Essentially saying, like, not even sorcery or divination, which is another word for the what he's called, can come against them. Like, Ada can't even get the sorcery to come against his people because they are righteous. Just like spirits have no power over you unless you are not righteous. Unless you allow unrighteous things into your life, then they have no power over you. So Balaam answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you? So this is Numbers 23, 26. It says, so Balaam answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you saying all that the Lord speaks that I must do? So really, Balak comes to him, you know, three times. And that was the second time, the second blessing that he gave just now. And here, and Balak's mad at him, and Balaam's like, look, I've told you already that I can only say what he gives me. The sorcerer says this. So Numbers 23, 27, and 28 says, Then Balak says to Balaam, Please come, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me there. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Horah that overlooked the wasteland. So this is the third time. So a lot of times when you read this story of Balaam, you're like, what did Balaam do wrong? Balaam didn't do anything wrong. Balaam was listening to God. He didn't do anything wrong. And a lot of times we look at these teachers and we look at these people and say, what did they do wrong? They're listening to God. They're speaking what God told them to give, right? We do that all the time. So Balaam, though, God already told him in the very beginning, don't follow this person. And then he comes back and says, oh, well, let me ask God again. I need to keep, I need to keep asking him because I didn't like the answer that God gave me. <clears throat> so, but their um, thought was, hey, maybe we go somewhere else, and then God will change his mind, and then he will curse him now because he's changed his mind because we went to a different place. Again, so they're saying that we need to do something now differently so that God will curse these people. So Numbers 24, 10, and 11 says, Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I call you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now therefore flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact the Lord has kept you back from honor. You know, a lot of times in our life we think um, God is keeping me back from honor, but sometimes it's to save his righteous people, and we think we're doing something righteous. But God is saying, hey, no, 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 that is my righteous person. I'm going to hold you back from that honor to yourself because you are going to curse my righteous people. And a lot of times we don't ever think about that. We just think about ourselves as, why am I not getting this blessing? Numbers 24, 12, and 13. So Balaam said to Balak, did I not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me, saying, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver or gold, I could not go beyond the words of the Lord to do good or bad, of my own will, what the Lord says, that I must do. And I just said that, really, I mean, he said that three times, and I just wanted to make that um, fresh in your mind, that this sorcerer could only say what God told him to say. When anyone's coming, to, there's all kind of people that say that. There's all kind of teachers that teach that. I can only say what God has told me to say. So then we have to look and say, okay, what is the difference between Balaam and any other teacher and a righteous teacher of God. So what do we know so far? Balaam practices divination. Whoever he blesses is blessed, and whoever is cursed is cursed. So like if I was to say, oh, this guy is righteous. Whoever he blesses is blessed, whoever he curses is cursed. He hears from God. Everyone say, well, I want to go to that service. I want to listen to that service, right? Everyone in here, 
I would be like, yeah, he hears from God, and whoever he blesses a blessing, curses a curses. Obviously, he's a man of God, right? Everybody, would anybody say, no, nah, no, nah, there's something else that we need to hear, right? Would anyone question that? He can't do anything small or great unless it's in accordance to Yahweh, his, his God. Again, so he's not saying, like, this is a different God I'm talking about. This is Yahweh, his God. Balaam continued to follow Balak, the world, in hopes that he would become rich. I just left that one piece in there in which you'll see this with Balaam and the story of Balaam. If Balaam really had a heart to follow God, then whenever God first told him, Balaam, no, don't do this, then Balaam would have stopped and he wouldn't have gone and cursed them. But Balaam kept thinking, well, if I can go get closer to, to the children of Israel, maybe God will see their sin and maybe he'll curse them then. So Balaam kept saying, and then God will bless me greatly. Because that was Balaam's hope, was that, hey, that this guy will give me all the money that he has, and I'm going to keep bringing it up to you, no matter how much you give me. It's like, maybe if you give me a little bit more, but I'm going to keep saying, doesn't matter how much you give me. Well, now I'm going to give you my whole kingdom. Now I'll give you this. Balaam's over here searching to get more and more and more to be able to curse him. But God told him in the beginning, do not curse these people. So we're going to the New Testament, and we're going to look at all these places that, that God had, um, you know, really brings back Balaam. So Revelation 2, 12 through 17, it says, And the angel of the church in Pergamos writes, These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword, I know your work and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual morality. So what was the doctrine of Balaam? That he teaches them to not follow the commandments, or to be like the world. So that was the stumbling block that he puts there, and we see that in Numbers, and we'll come back, come back to that. So, so verse 15 says, Thus you have, have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, I, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with a the sword of my mouth. He who has an, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden man to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So the other thing I just wanted to point out here is, the people who have this doctrine of Balaam are in the churches. They're teachers in the churches. So many times we think, like, well, they're not even considered the church. Those people right there who are listening to that teacher, they're not even part of the church. No. It's here saying that Balaam has a doctrine of Balaam. It's actually in the church. And God, when God's talking about churches, he's not thinking about this building here. He's thinking about the congregation of believers. So those people who are teachers in the congregation of believers who are teaching others to follow after the world, right? So what did Balaam do wrong? So this is Numbers 31, 16, this is not the verse because it's really the whole passage, and I'll just summarize it. The women of Midian were used by the council of Balaam to make Israel trespass against Yahweh. So Balaam came to him and says, well, I cannot curse these people, so I'm going to tell these women, hey, if you'll go and you'll intermarry with Israel, you start intermarrying with them, start teaching them about your gods and teaching them about your ways, then they will be, they will start following those things and then God will curse them himself. I won't have to curse them. God will curse them and then you'll be able to defeat them. Because Balaam knew that he himself couldn't say anything. It was only if the children of Israel quit following him would they, um, would, then God would curse them. So as we go through these other passages, you're going to see that's what the counsel of Balaam is is whenever the teachers are bringing in the world and saying, hey, yeah, these things of the world are fine for you to do. And it's okay for you to do this. And then God is the one who comes and brings judgment on the church. And he doesn't even have to. So Matthew 7, 15 through 29 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So you're not going to look at the teachers and say, oh, yes, that teacher, he is definitely a bad person. You're not going to look at him and see it. It's good, because they're going to be in sheep's clothes, and you're going to think, that's a sheep, right? It says, you will know them by their fruit. 
Do men gather grapes from the thick bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit you will know them. Now everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So then you see, oh, but they had the gifts of the Spirit, Father. Those people had the gifts of the Spirit. They healed in your name. They cast out demons in your name. They did wonders in your name. Even just, you know, what we have. We had a couple weeks ago, we had someone healed in his name. And we've seen healings. We've seen dreams. We've seen all these things, right? Is that the thing to trust, that that person is from God? There's many people that that is their God. Their God are the, are the, the mighty things, the fancy-looking things that these people are healed, and everyone will run to that. I'm going to go see. It's a healer. And that's what they're attracted to. Instead of being attracted to hearing the Spirit of God into their life, that's going to change them to follow him. Keep going. So 24 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I would liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So usually these verses are separated. There's two different teachings that are done here. Usually you have the one teaching that's done in the first part of this, and you have a totally different teaching that's done on this. So, so usually people are like, oh, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I would like him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain descends, the flood came, and the winds blew, and the beetle in that house, and it did not fall. It was founded on that rock. And, we're, and then we're saying, oh, you need to found yourself on the rock. And we, list, we don't even pay attention to the first verse that happened before. We keep going. It says, but whoever, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rain descended, the flood came, the wind blew and beat on that house, and it fell great was its fall. And was it? And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Many times those things are, are separated. But really these things go together because we have to look at the fruit of people's lives. Because people can go and they can teach and they can do all these mighty things. But if the fruit of their life isn't a life of service and a life that is free of the world, then we shouldn't listen to them. Because we can see their fruit. Or are they kind? Or are they gentle? Or are they care for the lowly and the weak? If they don't have that, then we cannot trust the words that are coming out of their mouth. Because it can be mixed. They might even be hearing from God like Balaam, but if we don't see the fruit then we cannot trust those words that come out of their mouth. We'll keep going. Just because, oh. Just because someone has power does not mean that they are of Yahweh. If your house is not built on the rock, you will, you will see signs and wonders and follow wherever. Your foundation must be the rock so you will not be deceived. So, like, if your foundation is not built on the rock and you're not constantly searching in Scripture to know Yeshua, if you're not constantly in prayer to understand who he is and listen to who he is, then you will have no way to discern whether someone is of God or if someone is of Balaam. 2 Peter 2 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, who bought them, and bring on them themselves swift destruction. Has anyone ever seen that? Have anyone ever seen someone who's in the walk and they deny Yeshua? I've seen it. I've seen people who've been on the walk and who deny Yeshua because they have all these other things that start coming in. They start at first. It doesn't start with, hey, you need to deny Yeshua. That's not how it starts out. It starts out with these other things that don't matter. These things that Yeshua doesn't even talk about. And all these little things, it's like they start talking about these other little things that don't matter. That even scripture doesn't even put much emphasis on it. And they start making this a big deal. And then all of a sudden, it's leading you down a path. And you start following a man instead of following Yeshua. And then you start denying Yeshua. Because you're concerned with the things of the world. But that's the, that's the thing. The warning is that they were among us. These teachers are among us. 
verse 2 and says, Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth we blasphemed. So because we follow those people, the way of God is blasphemed. By covetousness, have we not seen that? I don't even want to be associated with the Messianic walk, right? Because it's been blasphemed, because people are going and walking the wrong way, and they're denying Yeshua. I don't want to be associated with that, right? <clears throat> Verse 3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not, has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. I've never paid attention to this verse. It says, by covetousness, they will exploit your with deceptive words. So by going to what you all desire, they're going to exploit you by deceptive words. So if your desire is not to get, grow close to God, but if your desire is just to have riches, if your desire is just to have health, if your desire is to have these things over having a relationship with God, then you will be deceived when the person comes to you who can provide for your needs. Does that make sense? Because if you are going to someone instead of to the creator, then you will be deceived. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly, and delivering righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So there's no need to worry, because if your heart is to follow God, he's saying, I can deliver the just. So I don't fear, say, oh, no, am I following the wrong person? Because I understand that he will deliver the just. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. So he's talking about who? Those teachers. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Hey, so make note of that. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. That's brought up, I think, three different times when it's talking about pro false prophets, that they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. So that's probably something we should pay attention to. If he says it three different times when he's talking about false prophets, then we should probably pay attention, and we should be afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a veiling accusation against them before the Lord. So saying the angels don't even bring an accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption. probably skipped five things. I did. Good job. And we'll receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deception while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices or are cursed children. So a lot of times we see that these people, we see these false teachers, and we're like, oh, man. Who are, they, who are they going after? They're going after unstable souls, people who do not have their salvation inside the Messiah, and they're not following after him completely. They're going after these people. And what should we be doing? We should be begging to save those people, those unstable souls. It's not saying they're evil souls. It's saying they're unstable souls. They don't have a, a, a solid foundation. But again, it says they have a heart trained in covetous practices. So these teachers if you see someone who is coveting the world and that their whole thought is about the world and how I can become wealthy and how I can become you know great in this world then that should be an automatic sign it says it over and over and over again if you are coveting of the world then you are a false teacher how can I tell you all to die to yourself if I myself 
or trying to make myself as comfortable as possible. How can I tell you to give up of yourself and follow Yeshua if I myself are going after the things of the world? They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the ways of Balaam, the son of Boer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a temptress, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they are lured through the lust of the flesh, through the lewdness, the one who has actually escaped from those who live in error. So what can we other can we say? They speak with great swelling words. They're great speakers. These teachers are great speakers. And they captivate your attention. And they allure through the lust of the flesh. So what can we say? If a teacher's coming and luring from the lust of the flesh, this is something that's got me just recently a ton. How can I go and try to attract people in from the lust of the flesh to come into this building? I cannot use the lust of the flesh to attract someone to serve the Almighty God. I can't say, hey, I'm going to give away a free iPad, and you're going to covet that. And you're saying, oh, I want the thing of the world, and then I'm going to trick you into following God. I can't. But that's what it's saying. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption by whom a person is overcome. They promise you freedom. You will have freedom from sin. You are free, free indeed. We sing these songs of freedom, and they come in, and they're slaves of the world. And all they do is teach you to be a slave of the world. And they say, this is important. You need this. You need a huge house. You need this. It doesn't matter. You are just going right back into slavery again. Our, we have to be slaves to the Almighty God. We have to be a servant to the Almighty God. And if they're leading you to be slaves of this world, they're a false prophet. For if, if, if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Yeshua Messiah, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse to them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. So, I mean, there's a lot in this. We could probably send the rest of the day on this. One thing, us, we must be careful when we go to speak to someone and show them if they're not ready the holy commandments of God. Because if we expose them to this and they don't have the heart to hear it, they're going to be held accountable for it. So we must be kind enough to make sure they have a heart to know God instead of trying to force them to understand the commandments because they will be held accountable for it. So everyone in here that's heard the commandments and that you know we are to do it, you're held accountable for it. But in the same thing, it says, for those that have come in, they've preached freedom, and never they said, ah, oh, give myself to you, God. And then they leave, and they go serve the world. They are held to that standard. And it will be worse for them than if they never came into the church and never agreed to follow God, and they never heard that message, than it was for them to come into these churches, for them to say, hey, give up of yourself to God, and then come and serve the world with us. Because now they're a slave to the world and they've heard the truth. Or you. But it's happened to them according to the true proverb a dog returns to his own vomit and is so having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Jude 8 through 24. Likewise, Jews 1, 8 through 24. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Wait, I thought of just people who had signs and wonders. You're telling me dreamers also defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries? 
Yet Michael, the archangel, in continuing with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. I was saying today, I was telling my family last night that I was scared to have this message. One, because I understand. I don't want to lead you, you all into the wrong place. But this right here, make sure that whenever you're going to someone, if you know they're a false prophet, still be careful. It says that even the devil, he did not rebuke him. He said, the Lord rebuke you to the devil himself. And he's talking about dignitaries, because in the same sense, you see, um, where false prophets are, are definitely uh, speaking of illy in Scripture, even the, uh, the disciples say it. But verse 10 says, But these speak evil, whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts, in these things they, have corrupt, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Again, same thing, going in the way of profit. Their whole purpose of doing things is to give themselves profit so that they can have be more like the world. These are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, what do you mean they're going to the feast with me? Serving only themselves, they're clouds without water, carried about by the wind, late olive trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. So that's another telltale sign. When you see someone who is not a servant to others, they're all about themselves, then you know they're a false prophet. You cannot come and say, I'm a servant of the living God, but this task is too big, for, too small for me, and this is too small for me, or I don't have time for you. Raising waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against me. These are grumblers, complainers, walking toward according to their own lust, and they have greatly swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Same thing, right? Same message. It's almost like God has the same message all through Scripture, that these false prophets are going to be those who are walking in according to their own lust. What they see in Scripture is what Oh, this is easy for me. This is what I want to do. <clears throat> they're going to have great swelling words. They're going to be able to captivate your attention. And then they're going to flatter you to gain, atten gain advantage for them. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before you by the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual person who cause division, not having the spirit. So is that how we got all these different denominations? Because we have all these people who weren't controlled by the spirit. And then they said, oh, well, this is my way. I want this to be done my way. I want this to be done my way. So then we're going to break off. We're gonna, we won't be brothers anymore. It's because we had all these people who are controlled by their own ungodly lust. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most high most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So I'm saying, what is your job? What are you supposed to do? You are supposed to be praying in the Spirit for these people. And on some, have compassion. So on some of these false prophets, have compassion, making it a distinction, but others, save with fear. So with others, hey, with fear that they're gone, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. <clears throat> so we couldn't do this without going over Deuteronomy 13. It says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer a dream, and it gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which... He spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of, dreaming, dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You should walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. So what is he saying here? 
Why has God allowed these people to have these signs and wonders? He's allowed them to have it to test you, to see what is it that is your heart. Is your heart only to have healing? Is your heart only to have profit? Is your heart to have him? Is your heart only to seek amazing things? Or is your heart to follow him? Because he will put people out there who will lead you away from his commandments, away from him, away from Yeshua. And, you know, whenever I read the commandments, I don't just think of, you know, wearing tzitzit, eating kosher. I think of Yeshua. Because there are people who are following Yeshua with all their life, their heart, their life, that don't do these other things. And if there's someone who's leading you away from giving up your life to follow Yeshua, then that is a false prophet. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and to redeem you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you shall put away the evil from your midst. So his whole purpose is to entice you just like all those other verses we're talking about is to present to you something in your flesh so that you will not follow God but you'll follow the world or you'll follow your flesh. And it tells you what we do. If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own soul secretly enticed you, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you, or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. You shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall you, your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hands shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hands of all the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he has sought to entice you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear and not again do such wickedness as this among you. If you hear someone who is, one of, is in one of your cities, which the Lord your God has given, your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, seek out, and ask diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it and all that is in it, and its livestock with the edge of the sword. So right now we can't do this, right? So what is death in the body? What is death in the body if we see someone doing that nowadays who's trying to lead someone away from following the commandments of God? They were removed from the body. That is death now. But here, what are we to do? If you hear someone who's leading people away from doing God's commandments and saying, oh, hey, come serve yourself. It says, you shall inquire, you shall search out, and you shall ask diligently. Each of you must inquire, search out, and act diligently. Don't just believe what someone says that, oh, Nathan said this. He is not following God anymore. You must inquire, you must search out, and you must ask diligently. Verse 16, you shall gather all its plunder in the middle of the street and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder for the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand. That the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you, and multiply you just as he has sworn to your father. Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments, which I command you today to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. So again, it comes back to if someone's trying to lead you away from following God, and people, they get caught up with the first part of it, and they think, well, hey, they're not leading me after another God. But if you're not following the commandments of God, you're following a different God. You might be following the God of your stomach or the God of your wants, or you're following yourself, which you're making a different God. But you're definitely not following the God most high. So how can we tell if a prophet is or is not of God? Did they lead people to repentance of sin? We are commanded over and over and over again in Scripture that we must repent. It says, if you you repent of your sins, he is faithful to heal us of all unrighteousness. If someone is not teaching repentance... 
then they're not of God. If they're just saying, hey, be healed. Yeshua always asked people to repent of their sin. He always cared about their relationship with God more than he did about their health. The most important thing to him is their relationship with God because he understands that our self, we pass away. So if someone's coming and saying, ah, yes, come be healed, and they don't care about their, their spiritual health, then it doesn't matter. They're not of God. They're just trying to get you to follow them and, and to feed their lust. Or they consumed of the world. You are not a prophet of God if you're consumed by the world. I myself have had to repent of being consumed by the world. I've had things in my life that I've had to get rid of. That I have seen, oh man, I'm, I'm falling off these things of the world. I care more about that than I have about him. I have had to repent of things myself. So like I'm going through this. I'm like, so Father, there were times in my life where I was this person. I cared about the things of this world. But now he has brought me out of it. He has saved me from those wants of this world. He has shown me, Nathan, I will give you joy. And I will use you mightily if you will follow after me. Same with any of you. Are they leading people to follow the commandments of God or their own? You know, one of my favorite teachers is Paul Washer. Um, he's just a, a regular teacher. He's not on this walk. But I've never heard him teach against the commandments of God. I've never heard him go and say, like I've listened to tons of his teachings, and I've never heard Paul Washer teach people not to follow God, not to go and search and follow the commandments of God. And he's just He's not on this walk. Because like if you are listening to the Spirit of God, even if you're not on this walk and He is guiding you, God's Spirit is not going to lead you to teach people to not follow Him. Because that should be a sign to us. A lot of times we see these people, oh, their Spirit, they're filled with God. But they're not on this walk. God hadn't revealed that to them. But God's Spirit is not going to lead a teacher to teach you to not follow His commandments. So we have to say, when we see that, say, well... He's at least not listening to God in this instance. Because God might have been trying to show him, hey, look, I want you to walk this out. And then they say, oh, well, I heard this in seminary. I've heard this somewhere else. So the question is, are they leading people to follow his commandments? The commandments of God are their own. What they've learned in their school or wherever. Do they lure people through the lust of the flesh? So all throughout here, it keeps talking about the lust of the flesh. That's how they lure people. If they're luring people through the lust of the flesh and they don't believe in the Spirit of God, well, understand now, through prayer, God can do anything. He can bring people off the streets into here who don't know and who are searching for God. I don't have to go and lure people from the lust of the flesh. Like, we don't have to do that. But if you truly, if each of you truly believe in prayer, then you're going to start praying and saying, Father, will you bring people here who need to hear your word? Like, that's what we should do. We should be in prayer constantly. Like, understand, I, I am here. We are all the same. Each of you have a purpose. Each of you have a purpose. I just happen to be that God has used me to do this. But each of you have something that you're supposed to be doing. And if it is prayer, then you pray without ceasing. If it is to minister people, then you minister without ceasing. Like, whatever it is of your purpose, if you would say, hey, I believe I have this purpose, let's pray about that purpose. Look, but each of us have a purpose inside the body. We're all, like, we're all on a wagon together, and we're all pulling, and we should all have the same weight. Because if not, you have only a few people that are pulling this wagon, and there's only a few people doing all this work. But each of you have a purpose. So the last thing, Balaam brought the world into the body of Israel to cause them to trespass against God. If someone is bringing the things of the world into the body and bringing people to want the things of the world and they're trying to bring people to God by the things of the world, they're not, they have no faith in the Spirit of God. Like if you, uh, what I've seen lately, if I have true faith in the Spirit of God, He can break down walls. He can change people who are sinful as sinful can be. And if you truly believe in that power of the Spirit of God, then I have no need for the things of the world 
have no need to attract people by the things of the world because if that is what they're attracted to, they're not going to be attracted to the Spirit of God. So last thing. Now John, so Mark 9, 38 through 42. So now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he did not follow us. But Yeshua said, Do not forbid him. For no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. So God, Yeshua didn't say, hey, he who is not for us is against us. He said the opposite. He said, he who is not against us is for us. So many times we have these people who don't look like us. Hey, they're not walking in the same tribe that we're walking in. They're not walking in the same church that we're walking in. So they're obviously not of God. But here he's saying that he who is not against us is for us. So be merciful to your brothers. One more verse in there. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Messiah, surely I say to you, you will by no means lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone was hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. A lot of times that verse is taken out by itself, right? But here he's talking about there's these people teaching over here, and they're teaching for me. They're all trying to bring people to the Messiah. They're all trying to be, bring people to follow his word. If, they're, if that's what they're doing, hey, they might not look exactly like you. That's okay. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. So that, all that comes together. If you see them leading little ones astray, then we should speak out against them. You're leading these little ones astray. So really, that's it. No climax. Look, I, I'm telling you, God is drawing us closer to him. And he is wanting each of us to understand that we have purpose and that we are to be going out. But he is also at the same time training us to see what we should see. To understand, okay, is that of God or is that not? But in the same way, each of you have the same, you all can be teachers. You all might be these same teachers. And you can be a teacher of the world or you can be a teacher of God. So we can't just go and look at everyone, look at these pastors out there. Because each of you might be a teacher. Whenever you're teaching someone, you can be teaching in the same way that I'm teaching up here if you're teaching one of your friends at work and you can say, okay, or we, no, nah, I don't, I mean, that, I don't know if we really had to do that. You know, let's just get these things. Look, you can be the same way these false teachers just as well as I could be a false teacher. So you, it's good for you to know this so that you won't be a false teacher when you go to others. <clears throat> so don't just think, hey, that's just a thing for Nathan and whoever else. So if y'all would, if you will bow your heads with me. Father, we humbly come before you, and we thank you that you will show us your ways and you are teaching us your ways so that we can go out into this world and make disciples for you. Father, we ask that you will continue to teach us, that you will put your boldness in us, and your spirit will be so heavy on us. Where we should go and what we should do, we will guide our steps, Father, and that we will be great teachers for you and great men of God of you, for you, and we will not be like Balaam, and we will not be like the world, and we will not want the things of this world, Father, but we want you. We want your plan, and we want to follow you completely. We thank you, Father, for your joy and your hope and your peace and for your guidance. We bless your name. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.